Last July, X10's parent organization, Life Extension Advocacy Foundation, had its second Ending Age-Related Diseases Conference, or ERD for short. It was a great event focused on the latest exciting developments in the field of rejuvenation biotechnology, packed with awesome speakers and talks. ERD 2019 was longer than its predecessor last year and proved a lot more popular. We completely filled up the venue, the Cooper Union in New York. If you missed ERD 2019, don't worry, this episode of X10 has got you covered. If you've been following this field, you might know that in the past 10 years or so, scientists studying aging have completely changed our minds about it. Uh, there's much more interest in uh, aging, I think, these days on a research level and on a practical level and a medical level, in part because the field has really developed tremendous breakthroughs. We understand things now we never understood before. We've been able to accomplish things we've never been able to accomplish before. There, there has been a shift in paradigm, a shift in our, our concepts of aging as a plastic process. When I was in medical school six years ago, I distinctly remember sitting in a lecture hall uh, on geriatric medicine where the lecturer explicitly said, uh, but of course no one is trying to develop drugs for aging, uh, indicating that it's something that we really couldn't do anything about. Um, and yet this very year that same medical school broke ground on a uh, longevity institute on the campus. Everybody used to think that aging was inevitable, that rejuvenation was the stuff of myths and sci-fi, but that notion has been completely turned on its head. In particularly thanks to the breakthroughs in our manipulation of aging in model systems, how we can now extend lifespan, delay aging, retard age-related processes in, in animal models, including mammalian models like mice, there is, there's been a great um, awareness or a much greater awareness now that we can manipulate aging in animals and therefore why not in humans. Very many people sort of changing their ideas about aging as being something intractable and hopeless and forlorn into something exciting, you know, that we can actually do something about. We've seen a complete 180 degree reversal in public and academic sentiment around this. We've really come to understand what it is that causes us to age um, and seen some evidence of actually attacking those things and seen extension of lifespan of mice. Healthy lifespan, it's important to note. Although there is disagreement in the field about how soon rejuvenation will become reality or about the effectiveness of the treatments currently proposed or under development, consensus seems to be that a future without ageing is a matter of when, not if. We will ultimately achieve full medical control over ageing. I would predict that would happen this century sometime. Translating some of the findings from animal models to humans, I'm optimistic about it. I'm optimistic about longevity drugs coming into market in humans. So I do think that's going to happen in the foreseeable future. Now, complete control of aging, now that's something we cannot achieve yet in, in animal models. So to think that we're going to do it in humans, well, I don't think there's any reason to think we cannot do it. I think in theory it's possible. There's animals that don't age at all. So in theory it is possible, but from a practical perspective, how are we going to about do it, we have no idea really. So I don't think it's going to happen in the foreseeable future. I think it will be happen one day, whether that's going to be 50, 100, 1,000 years from now, I don't know, but I do think it will happen one day. I don't think that there's any necessary limit, um, at least not from a physics or biological perspective. Medically, things take a very long time in order to test properly, so um, I think that we will know a lot more about the degree to which we can prevent diseases of aging uh, after we start really establishing a paradigm where we can test clinical, clinically drugs for prevention of disease. I think it's going to still take a little while before that's done routinely. Researchers and advocates of rejuvenation also agree on the fact that focusing on the prevention and the treatment of aging is extremely important for humanity as a whole. Aging is directly or indirectly the greatest cause of suffering, disease and death in, in the world. There is quite a lot of consensus that these diseases have a common cause and this common cause is uh, aging. Um, so we really need to tackle aging to, to address the, the growing of the population and to, to um, eradicate or at least ameliorate uh, um, the, the various diseases and degenerative conditions that are associated with aging. 
Personally, uh, I would like to think that you know any person over time would gravitate to the idea that life is good and is worth living, and thereby, as a natural extension of it, I guess pun intended, that more life is a good thing, not just for you, but for the people you love and anyone who is wanting to be alive. Just like Earth 2018, the conference this year brought together some of the most famous researchers of the field working to understand aging and to bring it under full medical control. And they discussed some of the hottest topics in the field, like epigenetic clocks or senolytics, that's a big favorite, primate regeneration, and a lot more. We're going to show teasers of a few selected talks, but you should definitely go to our YouTube channel and check the full talks there. The Earth 2019 playlist is right up here, but also down in the description below. Senescent cells are thought to be one of the drivers of aging. They're cells that no longer divide. Instead, they linger around, causing chronic inflammation which contributes to many of the diseases of aging. These metabolically active cells are giving off uh, a lot of things that are deleterious to the, to the surrounding area and, I would argue, systemically. So the senescence-associated secretory phenotype has been well characterized, results in the secretion of, of many signaling cytokines that circulate throughout the body, uh, some local metalloproteinases that, that wreak havoc in the local microenvironment, and, uh, and really have been demonstrated in, in many uh, very important and high impact studies over the past five years to be associated with pretty much every single age-related degenerative disease that, uh, that we're aware of. Senescent cell clearance is one of the most explored avenues to prevent and mitigate age-related diseases, with lots and lots of different startups developing their own approaches. At ER 2019, John Lewis from Ocean Biotechnology explain his company's approach and why he thinks it may have an edge over other approaches. So Ocean has decided to, um, to adopt a genetic approach that we feel is extremely selective. We're using uh, a lipid nanoparticle approach. It's a novel type of nanoparticle that I'll be describing, uh, carrying a plasmid-based gene therapy that provides extreme selectivity for senescent cells. So in general, we have uh, what's called a Fusagenics lipid nanoparticle platform. So this is a, a well-tolerated, uh, broadly applicable gene therapy platform. Uh, and we have a DNA plasmid that really confers selectivity by using selective engineered promoters to drive suicide genes and eventually lots of other things as well. And we can engineer these promoters to be you know, selective for certain types of cells, avoid other certain types of cells by adding you know, elements like enhancers and, and repressors to really make them exquisitely specific for the cells we're targeting. In any case, it's worth remembering that the role of senescent cells in human aging hasn't been definitively established yet, as Dr. De Magallanes reminded us. Most of the evidence for the role of senescent cells in aging degenerative processes came from mice. Um, the causal evidence from genetic modified mice um, again, comes from rodents, it doesn't come from humans. So we know there are senescent cells in humans, but what happens if we ablate them, we don't know for sure. I mean, my guess, like a lot of things in biology and in medicine is, if you're going to be beneficial in some occasions, it's probably going to be detrimental as well in others. So what we need still to figure out is the role of senescent cells in human aging, and when is it important to intervene to ablate those. One of the most exciting ERT talks was given by Dr. Greg Fahey from Intervene Immune, a company trying to rejuvenate the thymus, a tiny organ with a big job, to produce and train the cells of the adaptive immune system. Uh, the problem that we have is that uh, the thymus, uh, which is composed primarily of functional tissue when you're first born, undergoes this progressive uh, infiltration with fatty tissues. The functional part of the thymus is gradually replaced even as a teenager. By the time you get to be about 50 uh, years of age or so, it, you've replaced almost all of the functional mass of the thymus with uh, fat. Uh, unfortunately, because you need the thymus to generate new T cells, uh, the uh, involution of the thymus eventually leads to a depletion of competent T cells which leads to an immunodeficient state uh, related to aging, which we call immunosenescence. To give you an idea of what this means, uh, 
If you look at your T cell receptor repertoire, which is the sum total of all of the antigens your immune system can recognize, there's a collapse that takes place between about the ages of 60 and 80, in which you lose 98% uh, of your ability to recognize uh, foreign antigens. And unfortunately, this leads to death. The company ran a small trial to test its approach, and it enjoyed extremely good results, some of which were unexpected. Now, one of the things we weren't really anticipating was kind of interesting, uh, and that was that we saw a reduction uh, in PD-1 expression on CD8 T cells. And it turns out that's actually pretty important, potentially, because it's known both in mice and in humans that uh, this particular population of cells represents exhausted T cells. Uh, but uh, beyond that, uh, PD-1 itself is a checkpoint uh, inhibitor that uh, participates in the inability of the immune system to recognize and destroy cancer. And as a result of that, drugs have been developed. And each one of these uh, drugs uh, costs $150,000 a year for the patient being treated with them. Uh, but we can uh, achieve a similar effect, it looks like, uh, with a treatment that costs less than 10% of that uh, amount. So in t and, uh, another thing that we saw in terms of efficacy, which we actually were not expecting at all, is uh, that we saw this increase in the lymphocyte to monocyte ratio. Uh, and looking into this, it turns out that if your lymphocyte monocyte ratio is higher, then you have improved outcomes for eight different kinds of cancers uh, or uh, reduced uh, likelihood of contracting those cancers in the first place. As you can see, the uh, lymphocyte to monocyte ratio increase was quite statistically significant and quite consistent. Uh, this ratio uh, is also correlated with improvements in inflammation, atherosclerosis, heart disease, stroke, and all-cause mortality. Another sign uh, of Per, perhaps sort of non-immune aspects uh, improving uh, was a couple of the guys uh, came to us and said that uh, they seemed to notice that their hair was growing in uh, darker again. Uh, this is the most dramatic guy and the only guy that we could actually document, but uh, his wife, you know, was saying, what's going on with you? Your hair is you're turning dark again. So uh, it's an anecdote, you know, it didn't apply to most of the guys, but it, it's a sign that maybe something really interesting is going on. Lysoclear is a proposed treatment for age-related macular degeneration, which is a leading cause of blindness among people older than 50 years. One of the major problems with this disease is it robs patients of their central vision, that high acuity central vision that really gives them the ability to interact with the world in a meaningful way. At the very back of the eye, there's this little indented part of the retina. It's called the macula. The macula is what actually gives us that high acuity central vision. Our central hypothesis is that age-related macular degeneration we view as an evolutionarily silent lysosomal storage disease that's driven by a very specific kind of junk accumulation called lipofuscin. And our goal at LysoClear is to develop an enzyme therapy that targets lipofuscin at the earliest stages of disease onset and progression. The treatment is based on lysosense, which is one of the seven components of uh, the approach that Sense Research Foundation is pursuing to tackle aging. In particular, lysosense is uh, aiming to give cells the ability to destroy waste products that the lysosomes, that is the waste disposal facilities that are built in in cells, are normally not able to degrade by themselves. Sense Foundation identified a variety of fungal peroxidases, amongst other enzymes, that are capable of breaking down uh, certain lipofuscin components. Lysoclear is being developed by Iger Therapeutics, and as its CEO, Dr. Kelsey Moody, explained during our conference, the drug did really well during early tests, and more thorough ones are on the way. We tested our recombinant enzyme using analytical HPLC, and we showed that our enzyme is actually able to break down every single lipofuscin component that we tested. Uh, we've shown that it can be taken up into cells by way of mannose receptor endocytosis, and most importantly, for the first time to my knowledge, we're actually able to eliminate existing lipofuscin in an in vivo system. 
These results were published in uh, December of 2018, and later on that same month, we successfully closed the financing round for our LysoClear program to take these very promising lead series and engineer them into clinical candidates. Chronological age and biological age are not at all the same thing. And to develop effective treatments against aging, it's important to estimate biological age very precisely. That's why the topic of reliable biomarkers of aging, that is, tools to measure how the human body ages and how well rejuvenation treatments are working, is so important. We know for most um, model systems that we actually typically use uh, life expectancy or all-cause mortality to assess whether we've had an impact in the aging process. However, as you can imagine, uh, that creates quite a bit of difficulty if we're actually trying to do this in humans who have quite long life expectancies and if we are actually going to increase them the life expectancy much further, it becomes nearly impossible to do this. So, as I mentioned, morbidity and mortality outcomes may not be feasible due to time constraints if we're actually going to try and do some of these interventions earlier in the life course before um, major pathologies have really taken hold. So this is really one of the number one reasons why we need uh, what we consider biomarkers of aging or measures of biological age. So we think of these as maybe useful proxies that can be used for evaluating these different interventions. Epigenetic clocks may be one of these tools, and there are many of them. In her talk, Professor Morgan Levine explained why they're important and presented the epigenetic clock her lab is working on. Um, if we think of the genome and we look uh, from 5' prime to 3' prime end, there's the pointer, okay. Um, you have these regions um, called CPG dinucleotides. So basically a cytosine followed by a guanine. And these cytosines can become methylated. And usually, although we don't understand the complexity of this per se, uh, this methylation will uh, regulate gene transcription. And so what we actually have done, and probably most of you know Steve Horvath, who I was actually postdoc in his lab, is we've used measures of DNA methylation across the genome, so at hundreds to thousands of sites, to actually predict what, um, chronological age measures and use these as proxies for uh, measures of biological or what we call epigenetic age. So there's the Horvath clock, which many of you have heard of. Um, however, what you might not be familiar with is that there's actually over a dozen different epigenetic clocks. Um, but the thing that we're actually finding really interesting is there's very core agreement between these epigenetic clocks. So um, something we're really interested in my lab is actually trying to decompose a signal and understand what some of them are capturing compared to others, and then can we use that information to develop even better clocks. And also get a better idea of what the clock is actually capturing, and in doing that, actually making hallmark-specific clocks. So not ones that are basically um, kind of a grab bag of tons of different processes that we don't actually understand what's going into them. Doug Etel from Eukadia Therapeutics came to our conference to talk about what his company is doing on Alzheimer's disease, a neurodegenerative disease that gradually chips away at patients' brains. Neurodegeneration is the primary feature of Alzheimer's disease. The tangles are on the top here, they're the little, the little uh, Eiffel Tower shaped remnants of neurons that have been sick and died. And on the bottom are plaques. These are waxy, tiny waxy deposits of amyloid beta aggregates that form in between the cells. Now, plaques and tangles and neurodegeneration don't just suddenly appear everywhere in Alzheimer's. If we look at the brain from below, here's the medial temporal lobe, right? The place that's affected right away is right here, the basal forebrain and this lollipop structure here. That's the olfactory tract and olfactory bulb. So if we look at the brain from below, here's the medial temporal lobe here, and it's connected to the olfactory system. So on the surface here is where the metabolites and debris accumulate, and they follow this loosely packed fiber bundle, which is actually projecting this way, down here to the olfactory bulb. And what happens to that metabolite-laden CSF after that? So if we take a skull and chop off the top, look down from above, 
Here's the front of the skull, the back's down here. Right, there are two little depressions that the olfactory bulbs sort of slip into, okay? It's called the cribriform plate. At the bottom of the cribriform plate are holes or apertures. Those accommodate odor, odor receptor fibers that are projecting up to the olfactory bulb. Now around those fibers are little channels that the CSF can go the other way. So the CSF that's in this area is going down into the nasal mucosa where there's lymphatic vessels carry it away. It doesn't drip into the nasal cavity. Now an interesting thing happens to the cribriform plate with age, constant ossification. It's happening to everybody in this room. Now the thing that happens with that is it starts to close off these apertures. So the escape route for this CSF is being diminished with age. And our hypothesis is that it's slowing the clearance of CSF, interstitial CSF through this tissue and allowing things to accumulate, resulting in things like amyloid beta causing uh, plaques. The technology that Lucadia is working on can predict the insurgence of the disease years in advance, and they're also developing an implantable device that might help the brain to flush away the waste products that are thought to cause Alzheimer's disease. If we can image enough cribriform plates, we can model and say where somebody is, what's their age, their rate of ossification, where are they going to get past that point? Okay, we can predict when it's going to happen. Okay, and to do that, we're doing deep learning. We've developed software to identify those apertures. Here it is. All right, see the little curves there. We can represent it in two dimensions. There, you can see all the apertures. And then we have another software called the Lucadia Aperture uh, Calculator. So we can actually figure out exactly how much space there is, what's the capacity for any given cribriform plate. So it's one thing to tell somebody, okay, you're gonna get Alzheimer's in, in eight to 15 years, start planning now. It's something else to be able to do something, offer them a solution. And that's our second product, it's Arethusta. It's, uh, it's an implantable device that goes in the cribriform plate and it restores the CSF flow. To develop a rejuvenation industry that can ultimately deliver treatments against aging to patients, investments are every bit as important as the research itself, and this is a topic that was discussed by a few of the speakers who came to our conference, such as James Pyer from Kronos BioVentures. So most companies will ultimately get acquired by a pharmaceutical company who will then do the latest stage trials and then sell the drug. And those acquisitions have been happening earlier and earlier. And even though they're being acquired earlier, they're being acquired for larger amounts with less time spent on those companies. As an investor, these three facts are really exciting, right? It means that you're making more money faster and you have to do less work to get there. Um, and so, on one hand, that means this is a great time to be investing in biotech, but on the second hand, it also makes investors worried. Most new drugs today come from biotech startups, and this is a massive shift from what the world looked like 20 years ago. That means that the vehicle of choice for getting an approved drug is a biopharma startup. Drugs that come from startups do better in the clinic than drugs from big pharma. Total amounts of VC funding per round has been going up enormously in the last couple of years. IPO valuations have been going up and up and up for preclinical and phase one stage assets, but not for phase three. You can draw two conclusions as you look at these five pieces of data. The first conclusion is, oh my God, this is absolutely the time to be doing a biotech startup um, in, in innovative drug development. The second conclusion is, crap, that looks a lot like a bubble. And if you look at the macroeconomic situation from when a lot of my data starts, right? From 2011 until now, the stock market's been riding high. We've been in this expansionary economy. Um, and so a lot of investors that are thinking today about where I wanna commit my money for a drug development program, 
right? They have to think, how is this market going to look three, four, five, ten years in the future? And there are some worrying signs for us that we have to be taking these this risk of, of a bubble in biotech very, very seriously. All right, so these were just some snippets from some of the great talks and interviews of ERA 2019, uh, but we recommend checking out our channel and watch them in full. Now, the three of us couldn't be there because yeah. there was literally an ocean dividing us from the event. And I don't like swimming that much. Oh, I mean, I, I would do. Not. I mean, yeah, that I, mean, I could have tried. But, mm, <laughs> Fair enough, but anyway. Cold and far away, but yeah. But, I mean, judging from the interviews and the talks yeah, the opinion and of the speakers the and everything. opinion of the speakers, it, it was great. Oh, it's been, uh, it's been wonderful. It's, I mean, I'm very, very impressed with everything, particularly in you know, all the excitement. Well, a lot of people, a lot of interest in the field. It's really a, a big change from, from even a few years ago. Um, there's a lot of positive vibrations in the field of aging, a lot of people wanting to, to really go for it. Uh, so, so it's been a wonderful conference and, uh, and it's been a wonderful impression. Uh, the LEAF team has done a fantastic job. I love the grassroots efforts and advocacy. Um, we even uh, uh, co-hosted a pre-conference workshop that I gave on how to build a pharmaceutical company in the aging space, and we don donated, uh, donated all the proceeds from that to LEAF uh, as an indication of the quality work that I think they do. So, um, very excited about the conference, very happy that it's a two-day event, love the panel of speakers, and it's a great opportunity to get a crash course on everything exciting in the space. Yeah, this is a great conference. Uh, enthusiastic, smart people, brilliant people. A lot of cutting edge things here, including things I really hadn't heard about before. Uh, I think the future of aging is safe with this group. Uh, I think we're doing a great job at this, at this gathering. Yeah, yeah, really interesting. It's a shame that we weren't there, but you know, maybe next year Keith might, you know, get oh, us we can get to go there. Oh, we can or, train yeah. our swimming skills the whole year, so the next That's year possible. we can. Yeah, maybe you can. I'm gonna go on a plane. Yeah, if, 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 if we can get a ticket by a certain someone, then definitely, uh, maybe we will meet some of our audience, so that would be great. But in any case, before closing, we would like to thank the Lifespan heroes, who are the supporters who donate monthly to Lifespan.io, and that allows us to do everything that we do. Extend the conference, the blog, the campaigns, everything. If you'd like to help us continue doing that, head over to Lifespan.io slash hero and make your pledge. Yeah, and hey, if you enjoyed this video, let us know by liking and commenting or sharing the video with your friends on social media. Yeah. And if you did actually happen to be at the conference, please tell us what you thought about it in the comments below. Yeah, definitely. Let us know. Yeah. And other than that, we'll see you in two weeks. Yeah. Thanks for watching. See you next time. Bye.